views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up on today's show, a tax cut and the creation of new jobs are some of the issues President Donald Trump talked about during his first State of the Union speech. We'll talk about how this affects you with our politics expert, Lee Bynes, will be joining us right in studio. Later on, we'll introduce you to a shelter right here in the Bronx, providing housing for single mothers or mothers-to-be. Plus, have you ever heard of the Siena House? Well, the shelter is, we got a special volunteer that's going to be in studio sharing with us how the shelter is making a difference in the lives of the community. And then we're going to take you to a show that's showcasing art and bringing beauty to housing buildings in Parkchester. More about this a little bit later. And plus, it's never too late to earn uh, English as a second language uh, certificate, certificate slash degree. Yes, we want you to know Lehman is offering a special program to help individuals achieve their goals. So we want you to take part in that as well. And we'll preview also a series of exhibitions designed to bring visibility to the dynamics of some emerging artists based in Harlem and the Bronx. We'll introduce you to a very special curator who will tell us all about it. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way because right now we're officially open. I'm your host, Darren Jaime. Today is Wednesday, January 31st, and you're watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. We want to encourage you to stay connected to us, and you can find out more about us on Twitter at BronxNet TV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, lots has been going on over this busy week, and we're going to catch you up with some Bronx updates right now. Well, Bronx music teacher Melissa Salguero did not have to go far to enjoy the Grammys and her $10,000 award for making tunes at school. Now, the teacher who works at Public School 48, Joseph R. Drake Elementary School in Hunts Point, snagged the 2018 Music Educator Award and joined a sea of celebrities at Madison Square Garden on Sunday night. Congratulations goes out to her. In other news, residents of Co-op City in the Bronx say that the giant bright electric monitors are keeping them up at night, and they claim it's about to get worse. A triangular set of three massive monitors that pump out advertising went up just after Christmas, mostly for liquor, 24 hours a day. The developer, Baychester Retail, who put signs up, has reportedly been unwilling to work with the community. In fact, the company's proposing to put up a much larger sign. Community leaders are calling for a meeting with the developers. Meanwhile, a city agency called the Board of Standards and appeals deciding if the new sign can go up. Well, the Bronx will be represented in this year's upcoming New York Miss USA pageant. Mont Haven native Lenise Stroman was selected after she competed with more than 200 other young women from across the street, I mean, I should say across the state, in a three-day pageant, including interviews, stage performances, coupled with numerous costume changes. Now she enlists the assistance of a coach who helped her grace the stage in five-inch heels. Now this was Stroman's first pageant, and she's a volunteer mentor for at-risk youth at the Parkchester Boys and Girls Club. Of course, we here in the Bronx will root her on as she strives to be the Miss New York USA. Well, we've got this and much more coming up after the break, including President Donald Trump's State of the Union speech. What exactly does it all mean? We'll find out more when we return.
our neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart doesn't, doesn't see race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. Last night, President Donald Trump held his first State of the Union address as Commander-in-Chief in the United States. The speech, well, left many unanswered questions, including a lot of criticism. Here now to break down this down and a whole lot more is our political analyst, Lee Bynes. And uh, Lee, good to have you. Good to be back. It's the morning after, and uh, a lot of questions still looming out of Washington, D.C., particularly uh, when it comes to the President's State of the Union speech. Talking about making America great again, but yet and still... Uh, on the hearts and minds of Democrats, uh, they feel as though the president didn't answer a lot of questions. Well, you know, it's it's it's, uh, it's funny that you would frame it that way because uh, that's kind of like I the take I took on it. It's uh, I've always been uh, of the mind that uh, when it comes to politicians, it's just as important as to what they didn't say as as to what they did say. And so uh, when I um, observed the uh, the speech, I started writing down things that I wasn't hearing. And when you're talking about the state of the union, the, 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 the union we're talking about uh, more than just the economy. We're talking about more than just the, uh, the, the stock market and this meteoric ride, rise. Um, firstly, as far as those two items are concerned, and he's hanging his hat on, uh, a lot of those things were in the mix before he came on board. As far as when he started talking about African Americans being, you know, having a, the lowest um, uh, employment rate in, in history. Uh, we have to look back and see the trajectory of that was going down during the, the Obama administration. So what I started doing was taking down notes and I came up with some pretty interesting items. And one of the things that when you start considering the state of the, uh, state of the, the union is, you know, what's the state of race relations in, in America right now? And he did not address that. When we talked about the S-hole remarks, when we're talking about the take a knee protests, when we talked about what happened in Charlottesville and, and beyond, mm -hmm. uh, those are major issues that are still unresolved in this country, and uh, he's been uh, behind a lot of that, the stoking of that, uh, that red meat type of uh, uh, activity. The second thing is, what's the state of uh, income inequality? That is a huge issue right now, and the president didn't, uh, didn't even touch that. Outside of the fact that a lot of jobs are coming in, but uh, a lot of those jobs are not going to offer a living wage, let alone a low uh, 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 minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we get to us uh, talking about one of the most important things in w that we mentioned, he didn't have a word to say on climate change. Why is that important? Because people have already forgotten about what happened in Florida, what happened in uh, Puerto Rico, what happened in Texas. People are not even thinking anymore about what happened in California with the wildfires and the mudslides that followed it. And the reason why I say that that's important because the United States spent $306 billion in terms of uh, uh, money that it took to, to, to rescue these people, try and find some way to rebuild, uh, and et cetera. So when you consider the fact that, uh, that the United States, FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, mm -hmm. only has an uh, uh, annual budget of 13 
$306 billion than spending $306 billion in one year. Um, shows you that ignoring or denying climate change is an issue. We, we heard yesterday. Is a problem. Know, yeah, yeah. Certainly. And we heard yesterday him use it for reference again, making America great, uh, talking about making America great. Most people worried about the economy, manufacturing jobs. Uh, how do you think he addressed the issue of the economy and improving? Well, um, he took credit for it all. I mean, if it wasn't for Donald Trump, again, the, the stock market would be huge. The stock market wouldn't uh, uh, be as, as, as big as it right now. Uh, if it wasn't for his tax cuts, he would, uh, the, the, the American people wouldn't have all of these high paying jobs with great benefits supposedly coming. Now there are, there has been an uptick in uh, jobs. There has been an uptick in some of the major corporations offering bonuses uh, to their employees. But I would say hold off on that, wait and see whether or not these bonuses are gonna come next year. What we have to understand and we have to keep in mind is that the tax cuts that the corporations got, they are permanent. The tax cuts that, the, or the, the pittance that, uh, that the middle class or, or, or below that have gotten are temporary. So uh, f before we put too much stock in the fact that these, these companies are uh, supposedly doing the right thing by their employees and sharing the wealth, if you will, we have to understand that this could be a one-off type of situation. And based upon uh, this president, I wouldn't uh, doubt that that would probably be the case. We talk about economy. I want to also uh, talk not just about the speech, but I want to talk about shutdown. Now, you were here on the show before. Absolutely. And we talked about the shutdown. And I did say that it probably would not happen. You said it did, would happen, and it did. Mm -hmm. But now we also face another possibility with the shutdown looming in about eight days. I would say that it's not only possible, but it's probable because since the last shutdown, uh, the sides have, have hardened. Uh, the, uh, the Democrats on the left of the, uh, of the aisle and their progressives that they have to satisfy, they are not going to accept the fact that the, uh, you know, what, what the, the, the Trump administration is proposing with regards to DACA, which we proposed to chain migration, and uh, the uh, visa lottery program. Uh, they're going to hold firm on that, and they're also going to hold firm on the fact that, uh, that uh, they're not going to want to uh, fund that wall. I mean, it is a non-starter at this point. On the other side of the ledger, we're talking about the Republicans, and they're saying that this whole concept of offering amnesty to nearly, you know, two million um, uh, undocumented uh, people is a non-starter for them. So I don't see that gap closing whatsoever. So we're, uh, uh, unless uh, anything changes miraculously over the next uh, uh, couple of days, we'll be looking at another shutdown. Lee Bonds, our political analyst, and he joins us now in studio, and as he's talking a little bit about the President's State of the Union Address, and not just only the President's State of the Union Address, but right now addressing the issue of a possible government shutdown that is looming possibly eight days away. Now, Lee, let me ask you this. If the government does shut down, what does that mean basically for Americans? Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, um, the, uh, those who, the bean counters, have already come up with the fact that uh, it's, it costs $6 billion a week. That's what it costs to, uh, to run this country in a shutdown mode. Now, you take three weeks, that's $18 billion. There's the wall right there, you see. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, no, there's going to be a significant blowback. Uh, quite frankly, I'm thinking on both sides of the aisle if this happens. And I would recommend as an analyst, as a, as a strategist from the, from the left side of the aisle in, in the interest of full disclo disclosure, uh, that the Democrats would be well served if they would add a little something, another brick on that load. And the, the, the brick that would probably uh, get them a lot of mileage and keep a lot, of more, a lot more people on their side during this upcoming shutdown mm -hmm. would be to address the, uh, the, the U.S. defense budget. We're talking about almost three quarters of a trillion dollars a trillion dollars for the 2018 budget alone. Uh, Donald Trump has requested, and it looks like he's going to get 18 billion dollar, uh, um, pardon me, an uh, 80 billion dollar increase in the military budget. Now, if you look at this globally, um, that uh, nearly three, nearly uh, a third of a trillion dollars being spent covers the, the defense budgets for the next 12 countries. Not only that, Russia's entire annual budget for defense is, the, is $80 billion. So um, if the Democrats had any sense um, and, and was thinking strategically, they would know that that's the issue to hang on the Republicans and get them to reduce that in order to bring uh, more social programming programs to, uh, to uh, Americans. But we're hearing out of North Korea the possibility of showing off missiles before uh, the Winter Olympics. Some people have great concern about that, saying the U.S. needs to be uh, adequately armed, given the fact of what we're seeing in North Korea. Uh, the president's saying, listen, we need to increase money, make it more relevant, and increase our uh, 
our missile operation. You talked about Democrats having a voice. What would be the message the Democrats should be sending in the wake of all of this? Well, you know what? Again, it goes back to how much they're spending. I don't think if you could raise it to a trillion dollars a year, and that will not deter the North Koreans from uh, uh, um, keeping moving forward on their uh, defense uh, of utilizing uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, to keep the, the United States at bay. Again, this is old news. Uh, the North Koreans saw what happened in Libya. They saw what happened with the Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq. Uh, as far as they're concerned, a nuclear arsenal is the only thing that will, will make sure that the United States uh, keep their distance, uh, and they're not going to stop. But if, you, if that's the measure that the United States is going to uh, 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 use uh, to continue the escalation in the, in the military budget, then uh, we're going to be spending a lot of money, and there's going to be a lot of poor folks um, uh, walking around here wondering uh, where their next meal is going to come because the social network, and that's one of the, the other issues that wasn't mentioned, is that the, uh, the Americas, uh, what's the state of uh, America's uh, uh, social safety net? And we're, we're talking about seniors, we're talking about the young, we're talking about educating um, our, our youth. And uh, if all of those issues aren't, th well, none of those issues can be uh, appropriately uh, addressed as long as we're spending nearly a trillion dollars a year for defense. Mm -hmm. And who is, who is our uh, uh, enemy at this, at this stage that would, would warrant or justify those kind of numbers? And one other point I'd like to mention is that uh, as far as the military budget is concerned, with all of this money that we've spent, we've been in Afghanistan for almost two decades right now. We're spending a ton of money on a monthly basis to keep that operation going. And uh, if you notice uh, the, the last uh, week, just one week alone, there's been so many uh, bombings and killings um, in, uh, in Afghanistan, specifically the capital, Kabul, mm -hmm. which is the most, uh, supposedly the most secure city in the nation. And uh, the Taliban is, is pretty much running wild. So where that money is going, how it's being spent, whether it's being spent effectively or not, is an open question and Americans could use a lot of answers. Uh, to figure out why. Lee Barnes, that's why we bring you here every week. Bring us the news and information in the world of politics. Thanks so much, Lee. That's my pleasure. All right, listen, take a quick break. We'll be back with more shows. Stay with us. Got more coming up right after this. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant! Behold, the angry giant! It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments. Goofy moments, sporty moments, dorky moments, kooky moments. Moments when we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. Chiru has no choice. She and millions like her walk miles a day for dirty water. But together, we can end their walk by providing clean water close by. Instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick, girls can be in a classroom and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses. It's true. When you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. And welcome back. A shelter in New York has become the home for 27 young mothers. We're talking about Sienna House. It shelters and provides women with housing and food and prenatal classes, as well as child care and a variety of educational programs. And here to tell us more, we welcome now Carlene Lavelle, who is a volunteer at Sienna House. And Carlene, good to have you. Hi, thank you for having me. Good, good. So when we talk about really being of assistance to young mm -hmm. mothers and to young women, I know Sienna House really 
that's that's the mission. That's the mission. So Sienna House is located in the South Bronx. Uh, it, again, as you said, it's a home um, to 27 women who are um, either mothers with children under the age of three or expecting mothers. Uh, they have a mission to help anyone, regardless of race, gender, religion, and they offer, uh, you know, everything in terms of services. So food. Um, prenatal classes, uh, life coaching, career development, therapy, and the space is transformative. You know, when you think about shelters, they can come off very clinical, very mm -hmm. distant, but when you walk into the Sienna House, because of the great staff there, um, it feels like home, it feels like love, it feels like grandma's hug, mm -hmm. and um, that's what Sienna does. So we talked a little bit about some of the services that you guys provide, mm -hmm. prenatal services, yes. child care services. Talk about the difference that makes in the life of a young or an expected mother. Right. Well, I think when you think about being a mother or in, in a family unit, a traditional family unit, there, you know, you have a support system around you. But being a mother, there's no guidebook for, right? Because mm -hmm. um, everyone's experience is unique. An environment like the Sienna House really cultivates a, a space where Whatever anxiety or fears that you have, um, you can come there and get help in every aspect possible. And not only from the professionals there, but also from the other women who are there with their children who've had their first child. They, they know the nuances and they can give those tips um, to help support them. You know, um, I think when you look at homelessness, right, uh, in, in, in New York especially or, or across the nation, it seems like it's one of these stereotypical epidemics that you either were lazy or you, you made the wrong decisions. But in New York, you, anyone can be one to two paychecks away, right, the from being homeless, poor, right. right, the working poor. And so, you know, you look at a place like Sienna House where some of these women are just there because the circumstances of life is just a rough patch. Um, Sienna provides a space where they can come and really build a stable environment for themselves and eventually for the long haul. So for you, you're a volunteer. Yes. What drives you to volunteer? Um, I think two things, uh, paying it forward. My family has always been, you know, vital in really supporting the community around you. And I think, you know, I, w I have to admit that there was a time in my life when things were really hard. Um, I didn't know I was going to get through it, but I did. And that's because I had resources available to me. I had family. For so many people, women especially, we may not necessarily have that. And then you combine that with being, you know, not you know, lucky, as I say, to, to have those um, resources. I felt like if I could make it past my trepidations and my obstacles, and I did, I would go back and give back what I learned and just be an ear for someone because there are so many people who just don't have that or may not have someone who look like who looks like them to really say, hey, I've been there and I've gotten through it. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the reason why. So for somebody who might be watching right now, we mm -hmm. might have a Bronx mother or a family connected to a Bronx mother, what would be the criteria for being a part of Sienna House? Well, the typical woman at Sienna House is 23 years of age um, and has a child or is expecting their first child. Doesn't mean that they have that they don't have women who are older or younger, mm -hmm. but traditionally they're a, a, a mother, a prospective mother who's looking for a, an opportunity to to do better for themselves. Um, the Sienna House was founded in 1990. It's supported by the Department of Homeless Homeless Services, and traditionally. Uh, anyone who is seeking shelter would go through the Department of Homeless um, Homelessness. Mm -hmm. So people who want more information, of course, you found the information at the bottom of the screen, a little low to know about Sienna House. We're seeing some of the pictures there that, we've, uh, that we actually uh, showed, so okay. I think we, well, we missed it. We'll come okay. back to it. We, we missed it. They okay. saw it. Okay. But um, talk to us a little bit about the young ladies and, and really the conversation that goes on in the house. Right. Well, you know, they're just like you and me. I mean, I pop in on random days and the conversation could be something like the State of the Union and what our president is doing. Uh, sometimes it's something as, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to wear when I go to the movies or take my child to, you know, to the next uh, ch child show or the next uh, child care center. Um, and then there's real conversations of like, how do I move forward in my career or my life? Um, I go in not alone, but with some friends who also volunteer. And sometimes it's really just, you know, that, the empowerment, the, the life coaching, the, the self-worth skills. So, you know, planning, like, what are we going to do in five years? What are we going to do in three years? But before we get to those three or five years, what are we going to do tomorrow to help us get there? Mm -hmm. So typical conversations I think you and I would have, yeah. um, your girlfriends would have. Mm -hmm. And the staff. Talk a little bit about the staff. Oh, man. Uh, so the staff, you know, it's run by uh, sisters. Mm -hmm. um, and there are administrative staff, janitorial staff, 
But the staff there, like I said, feels like family. Like when I walk in and as a volunteer and from day one, you know, it could have been very, it's, it's a professional environment, but I feel loved. Mm -hmm. I'm not into something I feel loved. <laughs> right. um, they're trained um, to deal with women. They're trained in emotional well-being. Um, many of the staff have been there for years, for over 10 years. They're gracious. You know, they know that it's a job. They know it's a responsibility that they have. Mm -hmm. And they do everything possible for these women. They, you know, sometimes when, you know, people judge other people. There's no judgment at the Sienna House. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone is looked at as an individual with potential and possibility. And we don't always get that. And the staff there um, just is phenomenal in that respect and regard. And if, if you had to say what makes the difference, what makes the difference for Sienna House? I think it's care and love in everything that they do, um, down to the meal that they serve the women, you know. Um, and it's kind of, I, I, I guess, a good example, by any means necessary. So if someone is struggling with a, a, a habit or um, finding a job, you know, Sienna House will go the extra mile outside of their traditional work hours. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of places are like, well, there's no budget, there's no funding, we can't do it. Sienna House goes the extra step, the extra, the extra yard, the extra distance. Mm -hmm. Well, Carly, thank you so much for coming and sharing thank with us you. about Sienna House. And, of course, uh, you saw the information at the bottom of the screen. If you want to find out more about it, please uh, get connected. And Oh, I didn't get a chance to tell them real quick. If somebody wants to volunteer like you, what right. do they do? They just contact? I think if you want to volunteer, uh, start in your local community. That's mm -hmm. the best way to do it. Whatever your gifts are or is, you know, use that to help sustain the people and the environment around you. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way to do it. All right, Carly Lavelle, thank our you. guest in the studio. Listen, we want you to stay tuned because guess what? We got more open coming up right after this, and uh, we'll be right back. There's one thing you can never have sex without. It's not something you buy. Or something you take. In fact, there's only one way to get it. It has to be given to you, freely. It's consent. Because sex without it isn't sex. It's rape. Consent. If you don't get it, you don't get it. It's on us to stop sexual assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. And welcome back. Listen, there's a lot of ways that you can connect with people, and one of those is through social media. And if you're on Instagram, I want you to know there's a special photography exhibition showing the architectural beauty of housing buildings right in the Parkchester area. Now, here to tell us a little bit more about the Parkchester Project, we welcome now the project's creative director, Sharon, and uh, we pronounce it Pandolfo, right? Yes, it's Pandolfo. Pandolfo, good it to is. have you here with us. And Thank good you. For sharing with us. Thank you for having me, Darren. So, talk to us a little bit about this here. Okay, so I, I think that uh, the project started from my love of architecture, right? Mm -hmm. And I grew up in the area, and I always looked at the statues. And it's one of the first things you see as you get off the six line, you start walking in. They're like the totems of the area, and I, I think everyone's seen them. Mm -hmm. And they're really beautifully done, and they're huge, they're terracotta. But if you have any affinity for architecture, you see similar structures in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So as I started doing the photo essay, and then I put it on social media because I just felt it was a good venue for it. You want to have a discussion, you put it on social media, everyone will start looking at it. And I found that a lot of people were as nostalgic as I was. But then as I started to do research, what I found interesting was the history behind the entire area. Because although I grew up there, I didn't realize what Parkchester was mm -hmm. and how long um, it had been around and uh, how it was constructed in the face of adversity because it was constructed during World War II. 
you know, as you go and you look at all the pictures, you'll see that on occasion it'll have like fallout shelter. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were just talking about, you know, politics, state of the union, everyone's talking about a war with Korea. Um, and we have fallout shelters actually in that structure. And it was because it was constructed in the case of thinking of bombs and stuff because of World War II. Right. So um, the fallout shelter science came out later because of the Cold War. But if I wasn't taking the photos and I wasn't really looking at the world around me, um, I wouldn't have noticed it. So let me bring the views in the, in, into a uh, bigger focus here. So you come out, you're looking across Parkchester, you're shooting, and you're seeing the beautiful architecture of Parkchester, and you say, hey, I want to share this with the, ma with the mass people, and you share it on Instagram. And as it's on Instagram, obviously a lot of people have a lot of comments. What are you hearing about the photos, and what are you hearing about Parkchester? Well, you know what's really interesting is how many people will say, thank you so much for putting it up because my father worked there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one woman wrote me at length because her father was a manager there during certain years. So she said, I've got to send you the photos because my dad has the pictures of the movie theater before it was converted into Marshalls. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, that was one of the biggest losses because, um, you know, industries come and go in mm -hmm. America, and movie theaters were a huge deal in the 40s. Right. And they constructed one of the largest theaters in the nation. You know, it was 2,000 seats. It was amazing. And then they made it into a Marshalls when they were redeveloping everything. I'm going to let my producer, uh, as I'm, that we're seeing some pictures now, and I'm going to slow it up just a little bit so we can see some of the pictures that we're actually seeing. Let you tell us, uh, walk us through this here. All right, so right now, that's one of the entryways. And that's terracotta sculptures. And this, I. I wouldn't necessarily credit to Joseph Kizleski, but this is like a slice of American life right then and there. Mm -hmm. um, as you look at the, the ornate doorway, um, you have immigrants. So there you see the boat, and then you see workers, and the, one of them is actually a farmer, and then you see family as a center of it. Mm -hmm. So each of these doors, are, they're created whimsically, but they're also created with a message. Um, I believe most of them are WPA artists that were contracted on the right. side of Joseph Kuzleski, who himself was actually a immigrant. Um, his parents were immigrants, he was one of nine, and he went on to become this amazing, great American sculptor. And he was actually one of the main people that you hear about with associated with these right. structures. Finding out a little bit about the history of Parkchester, let's, let's take a look at another picture here. I think we have a couple more that we wanted to show, and uh, if not, we're gonna, we'll talk, but I think we have a couple more we can go back to and. Uh, yeah, we'll take a look at Okay, there it is right here. I'm seeing it on so, the screen. So, all right. So, right. right there you can see this actually is at the theater and at the side. Uh -huh. So, once again, what's really cool about this is you see the male and the female. The man has a gun. The woman has a mic. And she actually is singing. And you see the notes on the side. Um, this is actually a horizontal piece. So, mm -hmm. it's interesting seeing this. When you go to the back of the movie theater, that's where you'll see the most ornate sculptures. Um, you know, it has a Native American. You have a man who's speaking. I believe he's actually protesting. Um, you have a Spanish woman in full dress, kind of like the emoji, uh, like with her dancing. Um, you have a torredor. Um, so that's all in the back, and it's actually preserved the best. These you'll see very similar over uh, the park, mm -hmm. and the parking lots, they're on either side. So when you come in, you'll find them, and actually they're not that easy to find. They're one of the more interesting sculptures because they're reminiscent of Roman, mm -hmm. and it's very art deco in their structure. Like when you look at the Chrysler building and stuff like that, you'll see those circular shapes. Mm -hmm. So another picture's coming up, uh, but I want to ask you this. Did you have an idea of where to go, or you just looked around? Um, to be honest with you, I'm from, I was, Originally, my first parent, my parents got an apartment and it was deeper in. Mm -hmm. So I started off near the Oval. And I have a really great photo of my mom by the Oval. And the, the fountain at the Oval, Fantasia, was in the 1939 World's Fair. And that's, this was displayed in the World's Fair. And originally, Parkchester, when it was created, was created to be the largest housing development of its time by MetLife. And the, one of the chairmen of the board, he was someone who, you're talking about the Depression era, you know, and coming right off the heels of it when this began. And he was someone who, he started off met life as an office boy, and he was a chairman. So one of the things he said in his little note when he applied for MetLife was, I want a place for opportunity. And a lot of the projects, it, this project was about giving people grounding and having opportunity. And it's something that you're seeing throughout the Bronx now. People are looking to create affordable housing to give people grounding and homes and opportunities. And this was created at that time with that in mind. So it's funny how history repeats itself. Yeah, so give us a little bit about this. When it comes to Park Chester, what is something that you know that maybe, maybe most of us don't know that you want to share? Okay, so the same architectural firm who created the Empire State building created Park Chester. So that is a big deal. You know, it's not just um, the structures themselves 
MetLife was involved in it. Um, it was white only when it was first conceived. Mm. So when you go there now and you see all these different faces, it's reflective of the neighborhood changing, but also the laws and the world as it has started evolving. You know, um, the one thing about American history in particular, and it's always good to keep in mind, is think of it like your ex-boyfriend. You yeah. accept that this part of history occurred, but you don't necessarily have to respect it, but it's important to see that people learn their lesson and change, and you see that. Because 1968, they allowed um, African Americans to move in, it became a diverse neighborhood, and to this day, you still are catering to the middle class. Everyone lives there as middle income. So if people want to see more, what do they do? You could just go to the, the Park Chester Project All right, and on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you for coming and sharing with us. Alyssa, we're going to take a quick break. We got more show coming up. Got some very special guests. We got some in-studio guests, and we got a studio audience as well. Talk to you about all of that when we return right after this. So I'm kind of new here but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. hiding in trees because they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Hey, we are back here on Open. Now, if you're interested in learning or improving your English language skills, well, you got a chance to learn about Lehman College's Comprehensive English as a Second Language program. Here to tell us more, we welcome now Professor Linda Moody as well as her students. And you're going to introduce them because I don't want to mess their names <laughs> up. This is Anya, and this is Noelia. Hi, Anna and Noelia. Thank you for Hi. so much for coming. So, share with us a little bit, Linda, about the uh, English as a Second Language program. Well, it's a fast-growing program, and it's a customized program. So students take a placement test, mm -hmm. and then we put them in appropriate levels. And it's all about communication. And we teach our students to have confidence and to state their opinions and to meet their next goal, whatever that may be. And so, Anna, tell us a little bit. You're a part of the program. How do you like it? So I'm a part of the program. I am enjoying it a lot because um, I'm improving my English, improving the English skills, how to write, how to grammar, how everything about the English skills. And what are you for yourself? I'm from Spain. I, I'm studying English for five months here in Lehman College. Mm -hmm. And I really like the program because I can improve my grammar, my writing, and also my speaking because we have a lot of classmates mm -hmm. and we talk a lot every day and we all are improving so much. And it's a diverse group of people that you have. From everywhere. It's like the United Nations. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so give us this about the program. How long does it last and, what do, and, and, and what's required of students? Okay, so um, it's 15 weeks mm -hmm. in a semester and we study reading and writing and grammar in the morning for two and a half hours. And then in the afternoon, we have listening and speaking. We look at TED Talks. We listen to podcasts. Um, we use newspaper articles and magazine articles and uh, music and uh, literature. Mm -hmm. And we talk about it. We have a lot of discussions, a lot of discussions. And, and I, get, I learn a lot. I learn a lot from them because they teach me about their culture. And I get to see what their perspective is on American culture. And so how, how have you enjoyed the program thus far in terms of being a part of American culture and then learning it a little bit better? 
Yes, we learn a lot of American culture. We also read different books in, in class. They help us a lot to learn and to improve our grammar. We, we watch a lot of videos in class and we talk about history, literature, and mm -hmm. other things. Do you feel more confident now that you get yes, it? Yes, I feel more confident because this program is very helpful for our for all of the students because we are learning uh, more about the American culture and uh, more about it's like a bridge to to go to the college because I want to start the college in September. Mm -hmm. I was practicing attorney at my country, and I want to evaluation my degree here in America. So I think that this program is helping us a lot. Right, it's, look, that's a great bridge, because mm -hmm. here it is in her country, she was headed towards being a lawyer, and now she can come here and learn English and that's right. be a lawyer. And Noelia has a background in law as well, uh -huh. and she wants to go on to college to study. Yes, I also study law in, uh -huh. in Spain, so this is a good bridge for uh -huh. me and for my classmates to pursue out our goals. My personal goal is to do a master's degree in international law. Mm -hmm. So these classes are helping me a lot to improve my English and be better mm -hmm. every day. So 15 weeks is the course. That's right. And uh, so for people who are watching right now, because we've yep. got a very diverse background, people in the borough yes. of Bronx and across New York City who are watching, uh, talk to us about what they can do in terms of being a part. Uh, they can sign up. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are no requirements to sign up. Um, they take a placement test to ascertain a level uh, and then attend the classes and participate and uh, we have fun. We do believe that it's important to learn English but have fun doing it. Yeah, yeah. And so your classmates, talk to me about your classmates. I mean, mm -hmm. is it fun meeting people from different backgrounds and different nationalities? Yeah, for me it's very fun to meet people about different countries. We are from Europe, from Africa, and we can learn a lot from each other. Also, we can learn about their, their culture, mm -hmm. about the things that they do in their countries, so it's very useful. So it's really fun, no matter how old you are, if you want to do something, you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important two people trying to pursue uh, law and enter, enter into law. And you said even for you, yes. as a teacher, yes. it's a learning experience. It so sure give me a little is. bit about the learning experience. Well, I learn about the customs and um, the way people feel about hugging in other countries mm -hmm. and the way um, people uh, enjoy their food, their customs, their dinner table conversations. Um, and, um, and then we have a conversation. It's a lot of back and forth, especially in the listening and speaking. And they're all interested in international studies in one or another one or another way. Um, and they sometimes it's just for um, personal enrichment. Mm -hmm. You know, they come to class and they really just want to engage and improve their English. They may not have uh, someone to speak uh, English with at home, so this is an important place where they can really try it out. Yeah, you kind of took my question away because I was going to ask you about: Do you have somebody that you speak? English to at home, or is it pretty much you're the only one? Uh, yes, I speak English um, a little bit at home, but I spend a lot of time in the school because we started at 9.30, mm -hmm. and we spend like five hours in the class, and we try to... With no siesta, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's so five hours in class, so that's a lot of time. And after that, we, we can go to the library to, yeah. to learn because it's a good choice to go there. Mm -hmm. So you can learn everything that you did in the class in the morning. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And beautiful. they have full access to the campus, which is beautiful, as you know. Yeah. And so that's a plus, too, I think, yes. for being yes. a student here. So if you're interested to find out more about the English as a Second Language program, the information is at the bottom of the screen. We encourage you to find out more at Leaving College, and uh, you can meet these two beautiful young ladies as a part of the class. You can meet Linda and uh, you can really uh, find out more. And so thank yeah. you so much for coming and sharing with us. Thank and, uh, you. Best wishes and congratulations to you both. Thank you. Thank you very much. All righty, listen, we got more show. Come on, stay with us. We got more coming up after this. Just going to take a quick break and we'll be right back in a few. <laughs>
My name is Osvaldo Adames. I grew up in the Bronx and went to school right here at the Bronx School for Law, Government and Justice. In the seventh grade, I hadn't given college that much thought. But all of that changed when I entered the Bronx Institute at Lehman College's Gear Up program. Gear Up helped simplify the entire college application process, helping me prepare for the SATs and organizing college visits and open houses. Last year, I graduated from Hamilton College in upstate New York with a major in mathematics and a minor in Mandarin Chinese. Now, I'm a teacher at my old middle school. I think back to seventh grade, and I honestly had no idea how much help Gear Up would be. They offered me the support I needed to succeed. If you're enrolled in Gear Up, talk to your academic coach or visit the Bronx Institute at www.thebronxinstitute.org for more information. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, a series of exhibitions designed to bring the attention and visibility to emerging artists is coming your way. Our cameras were present during the opening of the exhibition. We'll take a look at it right now. This evening we have the opening of two exhibitions. One is their first uh, New York City debut of Lucia Hierro. The show is titled Mercado. Here I have a series of works that I made this year dealing with my New York Dominican heritage and the trade between the, the two places of objects and cultural items that resonate with both communities in New York and in the Dominican Republic. We're also opening the second edition of Selections. Selections is a collaboration with Elizabeth D. Gallery, focused on celebrating and highlighting artists that live in Uptown, Harlem, Washington Heights, and the Bronx. We're so fortunate to be able to host this every year. We support and spotlight them right at the beginning of their careers when they're about to go to the next level. I construct uh, still lifes based off of collages, uh, imagery that I've collected from personal, mundane, and and also sacred images, things of like prayer rugs uh, that I use on an everyday basis. I'm very interested in the relationship between painting and sculpture and, uh, and the monumentality. So I'm really interested in uh, minute uh, nuances of the everyday and the everyday objects and their language and how these uh, interfere with our, our reality. The drawings that I have uh, behind me are coming from a series of works that look at the playing field and sports as a way to talk about migration and moving from one place to another. I'm really excited to be showing these works, especially as someone who uh, immigrated from Ecuador to the Bronx, and that transition has been a huge influence on my work. In this series, I connect visuals that have to do with caretakers and parents and people from the community. The pieces that you see in the back are a combination of ink drawings, the large scale pieces, and then the frame pieces are made with thread. Selections for me um, is an opportunity to create a platform for emerging artists who are from the community. Artists are the social documenters and responders to the, to the social, political, and economic times. And they are the ones that are writing history. Our community is changing and evolving. And I think we rarely have an opportunity to see artists that reflect that change, that evolution. These are things that just help us think more deeply about the challenges and also the opportunities that are happening in our society. And joining us right now in studio is the curator, Larry Ose Mensa, who's here with us. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, you. listen. A lot of hard work going into that one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So talk to us about this. You really wanted to uh, focus and had this special focus. You had artists from Washington Heights, Bronx, Harlem. Give us a little bit about just that whole perspective. So um, the exhibition is in partnership with Elizabeth D. Gallery, which is located in Harlem on 126th and 5th. Uh, and, and part of the space is actually the original Studio Museum space. And so we last year started to work in collaboration to develop this series selections specifically focusing on artists from the community, so that being Washington Heights, Harlem, and the South Bronx. And so this year's the second uh, iteration, and we have a new group of four artists, Anthony Giannini, Arini Maga, Leslie Jimenez, and Ronnie Cavedo. Mm -hmm. um, and then concurrently, 
one of the alumni from the show last year, Lucia Yerdo, we're actually doing her New York City debut, uh, which is an exhibition entitled Mercado. Wow. wow. So for those people who want to know a little bit more about what's behind this, give us a little bit of the background of what, what, what's behind uh, so f for me personally, I'm born and raised in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't necessarily grow up going to museums, but I have discovered uh, in my adulthood the power of art to change the way we think about ourselves, uh, to change the way, change the conversation, change the discourse. And so I'm really invested in artists, particularly emerging artists of color, whether that be black, Latino, Asian, Middle Eastern, and giving them a platform to have their voices be heard. And so with these two exhibitions, is really um, continuing in that interest, but particularly also just finding artists who, you know, are making great work mm -hmm. and I think are on the cusp of, you know, really exploding into the art market and representing, you know, our community internationally. Yeah, so how'd you go about finding these guys? Uh, yeah, ladies, I should say. Yeah, so I mean, it was, it was, it was a lot of hard work. I think uh, this is one of the toughest shows to put together because I really, you know, as a Bronxite, I was super sensitive um, to the dynamic in terms of the mix of artists mm. uh, and also the things and concerns that the artists are interested in their practice. You know, so you have Ronnie Covado whose work, um, some of the things he's thinking about is migra migration um, as someone who was born in Ecuador and grew up in the Bronx. You have Leslie Jimenez who's a mother. She has a series called Humble Heroes and she was reflecting on celebrating just, you know, the role of parenting mm. and also the caregivers. Uh, that she sees in her community who happen to be mostly immigrants. Or Irene Maga's her show, um, or her portion of the show is celebrating the unmonumental. So it's something as like simple as like iPhone head earphones or like, you know, cigarette butts or pencils. Really small things that we innocuous things that are part of our everyday life that we normally ignore. Mm -hmm. um, and then Anthony Giannini who's using different collage techniques to create paintings that look at the sacred and the mundane. Um, and then, you know, you, you juxtapose that with Lucia's, Lucia's show, which is introducing these larger-than-life bags. Um, and that really looks at a conversation uh, around, you know, cultural and economic exclusion. You know, so taking something familiar like a tote bag and items that are, you know, if you grew up in New York or if you're of Dominican descent, you know what a supermarket circular looks like. You know what Goya beans look like. You know what Jordans look like. Um, but how do you take those familiar objects and then use them as a subversive tool to talk about um, oppression, to talk about fetishization of like, you know, communities that would be considered to be on the margin. So there are a lot of themes that um, the artists are proposing through their work. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I was initially just putting everything together, I was just thinking about the notion of migrating the margins, mm -hmm. you know, and now Harlem and the Bronx have become these center points of conversation and experience Absolutely. for contemporary art. What does that really mean? And how do you showcase artists that uh, reflect that? So it was a lot of talking to friends, talking to other artists, doing studio visits, um, you know, scouring the web. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like, you know, I basically left no stone unturned in order to find artists who I feel truly represent um, these concerns and these ideas and represent our community. Well, you certainly rep in the Bronx. Thank you, and, yeah, for Thank you for it. repping the Bronx in, thank you. In, in, a, in, a, in a major way. Yeah. So for people who want to find out more, see more, what do they do? Yeah, so you can check out the exhibition online to get more information at Elizabeth D-E-E, -E, ElizabethD.com. Mm -hmm. You could also follow the conversation online at Lucia Yero Mercado, hashtag Lucia Yero Mercado, and then also hashtag Selections 2008. Um, this Saturday, February 3rd at 1.30, we're going to do an artist talk with the artists who are in selections. Mm -hmm. And then on February 10th, we're going to do an artist talk with Lucia and Doug Ashford. Um, and also, another thing, just one more quick point. I also um, really want to make sure that kids in the community are seeing uh, the exhibition. Right. So if uh, anybody, you know, whether you're a teacher or you have an after-school program, um, is interested in bringing their students, I'm more than willing to give them a tour. So uh, they can reach out to me. Uh, I'll give you my email, okay. <laughs> Larry at my my global hustle dot com. That's again, Larry at my global hustle dot com. If you want to bring your students, send me an email. We'll organize a day because that's also for me the core uh, component with this exhibition is making sure that kids see artists that are reflective of themselves mm -hmm. and you know reflective of the community. That's awesome. 
Mario Cimenta. Thank you, I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for coming, Sharon, Thank you. my brother, and congratulations Thank to you. Thank you, I appreciate All righty. Larry Ose Mensa, curator from the Bronx, repping the Bronx, and uh, that's a great way to end the show, repping the Bronx. Listen, we come to the end of our show today. I want to thank our guests for joining us, but most of all, I want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the re cast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum's Channel 67. If you're watching on Verizon Files, of course, that's Channel 33, or you can watch us anytime, and I mean anytime. 24 hours a day on the web at bronxnet.org. For all of us here on the set of Open, I'm Darren Hyman saying take care, God bless, and most of all, keep this channel wide open.